Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Arman, can you confirm that uh, you're able to hear me? Yeah, it's working now. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, you're coming in clear. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining this evening. Um, last week, we looked at the churches under the Bakratuni kingdom and how it displayed a unique Armenian characteristic and spirituality in its architectural design. Uh, today, we're going to go a bit south from where we were last week um, and look at the Holy Cross Church and the Lake Lawn region in general, which has been set aside for today's lecture. I have several goals in today's lecture, one of which is to give, give enough historical context to appreciate what this place um, is and how we describe, I, I, if you're looking at from this slide photo now, really how one could describe it as Eden on Earth uh, and what it is all about. While the Holy Cross Church on the island of Achtamar is the only surviving structure on the island and the best known of the Arts, uh, Arts, uh, Artsuni churches, it is far from the only church in the Lake Van region. Not only did the other islands in the lake also uh, house churches, monastic communities, but the entire lake shore was ringed with churches and monasteries of all sizes, making the region an exceptionally rich Armenian spiritual center. The ruins of the city of Jevash, modern day known as Jevash, which is the city of Vostan, which was a capital city both during the Urartut uh, Urartu period, but also the Artsunis, the Reshtuniks before the Urart, before the Artsunis. I will get into a little bit of that. Um, south of the Lake Van, we, we have Narek. North of it, we have Artske, Van. They all bear witness to years of neglect under the rule of Turkey, um, yet they are still eloquent testimonies written in stones to the depth of Armenian faith and the presence of Christian spirituality in the region. As a way of orientation, uh, here's a map to situate our discussion today. Most of my talk will focus in this boxed area uh, known as today the modern-day Eastern Turkey, uh, immediately west of Armenia, north of Iran. Uh, and another map just to sort of help us orient. This is a map from Houston. Uh, the geographic borders are from the medieval period. Um, and again, here is the center uh, of our discussion today, the Lake Van region. And because I do like maps, one more is to speak of the uh, so the really the number of the churches and the monasteries. As I tried to highlight, I sort of almost gave up at one point because I literally had to put mm -hmm. about hundreds of these boxes. <clears throat> but I'll say a bit more just now. The religious, monastic, and ecclesiastical background in this period is informative on multiple fronts. This is a time period where Armenia had lost all of her, uh, the, the mapping period, all of her pol pol political state and rulership. And the only structures that informed Armenian Christianity in this region for a long time in the medieval period was focusing right on the Ahtamad Kadariko state. And this is, I've highlighted right uh, in the center with purple. We see here on the map centers of monastic life with very active manuscript illuminations and productions all throughout the late medieval period, despite of the political turmoil that this region experienced. Uh, the blue circles uh, identify centers of Armenian life, socio and economic prosperity, centers of creativity, but also it, as it was part of my a long decade long research and dissertation, it was places where martyrdoms take took place. I have in yellow Mahed's door, uh, if many of us who are familiar with the air uh, region may know. Narika Bank, I have it in orange just for our orientation, which we will speak of uh, and refer to later in, the, in this lecture. 
And the purple, uh, I have highlighted the islands, which I do want to say one or two words, again, zooming out a little bit before I center and focus on the Ahtamar Church, the Holy Cross Church. Um, here we have uh, one of the islands, so there are several islands other than the island of Ahtamar. This is Lim Island and what is left of it, really an Anabad these days. But at one point, similar to what we had on the island of Ahtamar, on Lim, we had a monastic complex uh, uh, where I would, I believe 15th, 16th, 17th centuries were the periods where they were very active in their my manuscript production. Um, I want to And one other, I guess, topographical note from the Lake Vaughan region is the water changes. Uh, we see here the water in the Lake Vaughan has gone down so much where it's revealing the Uratunian road that once led from the shores of Vaughan to the Kututs Island. That's another island. So again, there's the Lim. Here we see the Kututs. Uh, and I'm not going to say too much about the Urartunian kingdom, which was an Iron Age kingdom centered at the Vaughan region and Bostan being their capital, uh, which I will address a bit more um, in, in the, in the co coming up slides. But I think it's helpful just to uh, speak a little bit about the islands around uh, Vaughan uh, as orientation for of zooming in to the Ahtamar Island. So Ahtamar wasn't the only island, but it was the choice of the Arsuni kings for their palace, for the Holy Cross Church, and so on and so forth. So here again, um, I thought, again, for the topography and sort of a, uh, zooming in from um, a satellite view, I thought it's helpful to see what the region looks like in its rich... Um, geographic landscape as it is. Uh, another, uh, so having looked at some of the islands and sort of orienting, orienting around the map, um, I like to also now look, so if we are looking at the map here, and I think you could see my uh, uh, arrow pointing, right to the south of this region is where we have Narigabank. And I want to show a couple of photos that ha have come to us from the 19th century, which no longer stand, it's no longer, um, it's been completely destroyed, to put it uh, quite clearly. Um, so we have Narigabank uh, to the south of the lake, uh, which at, uh, in the current moment, um, one of the recent photos, as, you could, as I can show you here, is, a, is where a mosque stands. And again, just Speaking of the region more holistically, before I focus in to the uh, to the Ahtamar Island, it's interesting to know all that does t exist around the island, around the lake. And another one uh, is uh, this is a bit east of Narigavank, uh, a bit west from Bostan, um, is the. Karmaravank, uh, a bit west of Jevash. Uh, so uh, again, again, south part of the lake. The remains being mostly ruins. Another famous one, which I personally had the pleasure of visiting is the Yedi Kalisi church, which is the Varakabank church. Um, and I have a personal story here, too, because we arrived at this place um, not really being able to, um, it's very difficult to find in the first place. Second, um, the keys to the church is held by a local, uh, local Kurdish family who was passed down to them uh, right after the genocide period in the uh, first few decades of the 20th century. And we just were not able to find a way to enter this place. Uh, except 
here's a photo from 2015 when I was there. This um, young Kurdish boy told us the stories of the village and the church and said, I'm happy to get, guide you to the place where you can find the key. Mm -hmm. um, and in our broken Turkish and somewhat Kurdish, we were able to find the family with this uh, little boy's help to obtain the keys to enter the church. Um, and we're able to see the beautiful remains that it still has to witness to what has gone before. Uh, currently, it's a, not an active church and it, remain, it stays in uh, utter ruins, but inside there's still uh, some of these engravings. Again, as I described, written testimonies written in stone, they speak loud and clear what has gone before them. And then returning to this map once again as um, orientation, the two blue circles really focus on what I would like to speak about today, which is the island of Ahtamar and Bostan. Um, and uh, as you also can see from the map, there is so much to really focus on in this area, whether it's the monasteries, whether it's the churches, whether it's the uh, various, uh, again, uh, natural uh, landscape that the place actually is to talk about. But for the purposes of today, this is the two areas uh, I will focus on. Now, the island of Aqtamaj was founded as a fortress with a castle of a king, uh, for kings and political rulers. The establishment of the Gatarikosid on the island also served as an enclave for Christian space. Uh, and even today, it remains one of the marvels of the region's history. As an architectural course, I can't help but to stop for a moment to think about how this is divine architecture, in a sense, if we look at it in its natural uh, depiction of the area, the mountains, the water, the shores, the trees. These are almond trees and apricot trees planted um, by the monks resident on the island long time ago. Um, since I would like to cover some of the political and ecclesial history of the region, and which is also very um, true to my background as uh, my research, um, I think it's very important to speak of the city of Vostan, uh, which was the capital of the Arsuni kings from the 9th, 10th century. And if you're looking at the church in this uh, image, Vostan would be straight ahead uh, on the shores underneath the mountains there. Vostan and Ahtamar Island have a long history and tradition in Armenian literature. Uh, during the Urartunian kingdom, uh, sometime 9th century BCE, it is believed that Vostan was also the capital of King Rusa, an Urartunian king. In antiquity, Vostan was the capital, uh, in, sorry, in antiquity, Vostan was the capital, uh, an important city of the Armenian aristocrat ruling house of the Rushtumis. Uh, and in greater Armenia, uh, it was also a fortress uh, and a cliff that overlooked the city. The rule of the aristoc aristocratic house of the Rushtumis ended with the rise of the Abbasid Caliphate in the 8th century, uh, some of what we've covered in the last couple lectures. During the second half of the 9th century, the region was grafted into the Bakratuni kingdom. Uh, we looked at the Bakratunis last week. By the end of the 9th century, there was a rival against the Bakratunis, um, a little complicated history there, and the Arsunis rose to power and established a monarchy in this region, and Vostan became the capital of King Gahi, the Artsuni. And thereafter, um, the Artsunis established their ruling Van, separate, a uh, completely separate army kingdom, uh, separate from the Bakratunis in the north. The Baskurakan Artsuni princes had political authority, um, not only in Ahtamar, but also in the regions around Lake Van, including very important center of Vostan and Van. Uh, the political authority had come to an end sometime during King Senekedin in the year 1021, 
when he, uh, King Sennacherib um, uh, succeeded his uh, empire or his kingdom to the Byzantine uh, arrangement, if I may put it that way. However, the ecclesiastical rule that will be established later in 1113, also from the line of the Artsunik, aimed to represent a continuation of their past glory, especially through ecclesial and architectural activity. And this was very important. Now the connection between Akhtamar Island and the and Bostan, southeast eastern shores of Lake Van, is not only a geographical one, as seen here. The connection is also observed in its political and religious history, and also in their architectural design. I would like to quote an Armenian architect who describes this connection beautifully. Uh, that, uh, David Kepmenjian is his name, One uh, describes it uh, as follows. One of the characteristic points about the location of the palace on Akhtamar is the existence of the town of Bostan on the other side of the lake shore. Akhtamar, Bostan combination represented a town planning assemble based on a Bellevue principle between the two cities and their palaces facing each other. Since the palace of Bostan was the forerunner of Akhtamaj, one may even suggest that Akhtamaj was the compositional continuation of the Bostan palace. Both palaces were walled towards the lake. Moreover, the cities opened towards each other in the stepping order. Actually, it is the intentional design, the seedal of Bostan and its Spitak church that stood exactly in front of the uh, Palatine complex and the Church of the Holy Cross on Akhtamaj. The pre-existing landscape and its features played a distinctive role in the morphology of the Akhtamaj complex, leading to the location of the palace and the Palantine Church on the promontory of the islands. So the positioning and the direction between these two places, Akhtamaj and Bostan, was very intentional and very much that to reflect almost as a reflection one could see in uh, across from each other and even in the water. So Gadi the first fortified the city of Bostan first, which he had which had been laying in ruins for many years. He built churches, including Saint uh, Georg, the pro the proto martyr Saint Stephanos, Saint Stephen's, Saint Mary, the Diotokos Astvazatzin and many others. Uh, to my knowledge, and when I was there, these are not churches that are standing. I have not seen them. I could, have, I could not locate them online either, but these are churches that do not stand any longer. He reconstructed the site in Bostan that were in ruins and built banquet halls. The continuator of the Arthruni history, this is Tovma Arthruni, in brief, but with an imaginative flair, paints a picture of the palace and the fortress which Gavi built in Bostan on the southeast shores of Lake Van, facing Akhtamar. He described the fruitful nature, gardens and fruit trees, and the irrigation system which watered the greenery. It had been in a place from the Uraktanian times, this irrigation system, and actually was recently discovered in an excavation from, I believe, in the early 2000s. Um, it had been in the, uh, and David I revived and restored it for his kingdom. After describing Bostan's landscape, uh, the continuator of, continuator of, Tom, uh, of the history, Tobma Arsuni, describes the island of Akhtamar and the construction activities that enriched and fortified the island. An image from the last decade of the 19th century shows the fortifications and the walled palace of the island of Akhtamar. Unfortunately, we don't have any of those remains anymore. And as mentioned before, the only remaining structure is the Holy Cross Church.
Akdamar represents the epitome of Armenian architecture and remains one of the only few extent Armenian monuments in which architectural creativity, artistic talent, and dedicated spirituality are intrinsically interwoven. The Church of the St. Cross is a distinguished, Holy St. Cross is a distinguished example of Armenian architecture and masonry built by the order of King Arsuni between the years 915 and 921. The architect of the church named Manvel had traveled far and extensively in the areas and was familiar with Zavatnos, which we may recall from a few lectures ago, and the church's Inani. His efforts in building this church was to bring together a massive scale of ingenuity and tenacious, tenacious, tenaciousness not seen thus far. And we shall experience this in a moment. The building was remarkable in many aspects. The stones were chosen and built in such a way, especially how it reflected the sun, that the colors of the andesine stones used in the buildings changed into yellow, red, or gray, according to the season and the hour of the day. And this image here we have is very sort of vibrant in its color because of the sun, but we will see others where that's not the case. And on the facade, there are scenes from, as we I will cover more thoroughly, on the outside facade, there are scenes from Old Testament, New Testament, along with motifs of animals and plants. Um, I want to read something briefly from the Artsuri uh, history, talking about the light, which it has become an important theme for me and theologically, but also for architecture, especially in the Holy Cross Church. It's quite interesting that this actually comes together. So uh, Artsuri describes uh, the historian, Thoma Artsuri, the summit of the cedar overlooks the sea and it's very beautiful. When the sea is stormy because of the winds, it waves appear like flower and are pleasant to behold. When the sky is clear, the sea attracts everyone to behold its expansion. Because of the king has proposed to construct its magnificent palaces, halls, painted streets, and various structures, which I cannot describe, uh, he has also secured it from the side of the sea by powerful walls, whose foundations were laid in great depth. Above the walls and facing the sea is covered walk, uh, is covered walk decorated with the gold ornaments and various kinds of paintings. It is illuminated with bright sunlight in order to dazzle the eye and bring joy to his heart, as well as to those who are worthy of him. He has also built arched doors to let in the cool air and bright windows that reflect on the center of the hall, the rays of the sun shining on the sea at sunrise and sunset. These rays change the colors of the images of the reliefs and the different structures and amazes the beholder. So it's to me reading that in connection with what I find to be a theological point on light yet uh, br brought about on how the depictions of this uh, magnificent artifact can actually speak that years later, of course, centuries later, close to a millennia later, is very powerful. Now, before I go into more of the specifics and details, um, I think it's helpful to for, for the purposes, again, as a course that we've looked at the different floor plans. Uh, here's um, the plan for the Akhtamar complex. And as you can see, it was a lot more expansive, only the church remaining. Um, and we see the, the cross, uh, as Dr. Irvin covered very well in the early lectures, uh, one of the cross structure that actually is present in the um, plan um, and the various corners, the four corners and all of that. I will not go into those details, but I just want to share this with you as the floor plan of the Ahtamar complex. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you may recall this slide I shared with you a few lectures ago. Uh, the design of the Armenian Martyrarium of Hrebsimen was a design that we find repeated in Ahtamaj. So I wanted to recall this. And this is something that Manuel, the architect himself, reflected. And so was the Vartnots, which I had mentioned, but both in their structure and or, or ornamentation. Uh, these were structures that he was not only familiar with, but had visited. Um, one other structure I want to bring to our mind before going into the details of the Ahtamaj Holy Cross is Noravank. Now we remember Noravank from a few lectures, uh, last lecture, also a couple lectures before. Um, and here, the main reason I want to bring this to your attention is the staircase. We've asked a couple of questions around the staircase and reflected quite a bit about the function of it and what it's like. And some of us have climbed it. But it's interesting here to say that this was actually a staircase, not exactly precisely the same, but similar, that was also once on the Holy Cross Church in Aftamaj. And I will show um, a few, uh, actually a, uh, an implication of it, not an actual image of how architects have imagined it to have been. Um, so let me get there. So this is going back to, ah, ah, there we go. I hope it will, yes. So if we reflect on this, um, this was the entrance to the gallery of King Gavik, according to the reconstruction by, by Orbeli, that is. You can see the reliefs on the top. You can see the uh, sort of dec the decorative band, which I will say a bit more about the bands. But if you can just imagine this staircase uh, that was at the entrance of uh, the Ahtamaj Holy Cross Church, it was actually intentionally made for the king to access the, uh, the second uh, floor chamber from where he actually attended and observed the liturgy. Um, instead now what we have in the place uh, from reconstructions is the gavit that has been removed, the staircase has been removed and this has been placed in the front of it. So I have a few images to show that uh, how it is and how it actually is today. So this is the front of it um, where the staircase no longer is Manuel's plan for the decorative uh, the, de the decorative designs of Ahtama made it necessary to carve several bands on which it could be illustrated the invincible faith and the struggle of the Arsuni clan from ancient times to the reign of Gamid the uh, first. The architects surrounded the church with five bands, the intervals between which increases as the bands uh, rise up the, the facade. Each band has its own uh, symbolism and its own means of expression. As a result, the themes of the main bands were not repeated. They were not emulated in any other bands, so they are very unique, each one. Um, the aim of Manuel was to give a living and a dynamic presence to each touch on this timeless artifact. The decorative bands comprised of reliefs of pomegranates, trees, vine scrolls, and they were all emb embellished with re-images of the extensive way uh, of the extensive stories of uh, of this of scripture. So I have a closer up photo on the next slide. And you can see the band here. 
um, the two of them are very, or maybe perhaps even the third one on the top are very visible. Now moving to the north facade of the church. We have Adam and Eve in the garden represented in this relief form. The next image is on the west and on the north front, just to be, um, just to include all of it. On the north, we have the angels. A second. Okay. Um, all right. So here we go. So on the north, we have the general view of the north facade here. Um, we have Samson killing the Philistine in the north. And this is important to kind of put together all the different stories from each angle. And then eventually why, why each one faces in the various directions and how they all come together. And then we also have Samson killing a lion. We have King Hezekiah. Uh, we have prophet Isaiah. Isaiah. Uh, and then on the lower parts, uh, where you could see the heads to the right, we have um, Adam and Eve, Eve and the serpent. Uh, we have Theodore killing a dragon, uh, bear eating grapes, lions attacking a bull, uh, David killing a lion, a vine squirrel, and a whole bunch of other uh, representations of the fruits. Fruits of vine, pomegranate. Um, birds, and it's interesting, uh, and I'll make this note here, the, the number of species represented on the Holy Cross Church, I believe over 30, some of them are extinct. So we know about them based on how they are represented here on the, on the Holy Cross Church. So there are over 200 plus reliefs and 30 plus over 30 plus uh, um, animal uh, species, all represented all around the church. Not to mention the flora and fauna, which each very, very much of each one speaking to their own um, especially speaking to, to their own time, but also acting as a preservation of that history. Here in the Western side, we have Gandhi the First and Jesus Christ. Um, we also have a further up uh, St. Matthew. Uh, all four gospel uh, authors are represented all across the, uh, the church. Um, here we have Gaudi, uh, King Gaudi the First holding the model of the church, which is a fair a typical practice. We have this also in the Bakratuni churches too, uh, various other places too, where the the king of that region is holding a model of the church. To me, it almost all, always reflects uh, Saint Stephen's uh, portrayal in miniature paintings, even or in various other Christian art. Uh, so it's very interesting to, in my, in my own estimation, understanding how these two come together. Uh, but it is, uh, if we look at early church fathers speaking of St. Stephen as a martyr being the seed of the church, these two come together quite interestingly, uh, both theologically, but also in this, uh, in this depiction, uh, to think a little more about that. Um, One other note that has been made about this, the, the reliefs on this, um, on the Western uh, facade is the, the uh, how Jesus and Gagik are presented in the size in which they are presented. So Gagik is presented a bit bigger with his clothing and his crown. Um, 
it's very interesting. It almost makes me think re and reflect on the letter that we have from of God talking about Jesus coming to the to to our to Armenia for protection. Um, it's very it's again various parallels uh, as they shape and come together in how the architecture is put together. In this next one in the western facade, we have the angels. But also, interestingly, another biblical scene that is Abraham and Isaac, or the sacrifice of Isaac. Here we have, uh, this is facing north again, I believe, uh, and it has St. Mary, Jesus, um, on the very right side of the image. Um, and we have, again, we have the other part of uh, Isaac and um, Abraham. Now facing south, we have Prince Sahak and Hamazas. I want to show this, how they kind of come together on the corner, uh, but also another image that depicts them a little better. How these are, uh, so Sahak and uh, Hamazas were martyrs during the uh, eighth, eight, so ninth century, 800s, uh, or no, sorry, eighth century. So 786 was their martyrdom. Uh, and now this is, another way of incorporating and bringing in uh, a continuity of the Christian history through Old Testament narratives, incorporating the uh, fam the Arthurmi family and uh, making space for them here on this uh, part of the uh, facade, speaking about continuity of the martyrs from early periods all the way down to their times. Uh, so I think this is very interesting how the Old Testament narratives all around the church are put together in a very sort of an intentional way. And here we also have the Arthurmis uh, come into that continuity, into that place um, to tell the narrative of not only suffering and struggle, but also victory. And also on the north facade, we have this uh, Satrag Misak and Abednego uh, in the furnace, the three young, the, the, three, the three youth, with Daniel, Prophet Daniel, in the lion's den. Um, another Old Testament imagery again, a story put together, brought to life in stone, written in stones, in these reliefs on the wall, telling the story from essentially Adam and Eve to the prophets, to the various narratives. And actually, I don't have the one on Jonah, but another very important one for Armenian theology and history uh, and understanding of the Old Testament into the new is Jonah, uh, where we have Jonah being uh, eaten by the whale is depicted on the wall. So the entirety of the old of the outside depictions speak these Old Testament narratives. What I find very interesting, and what I find to be a natural theological insight in through this architecture, is how these Old Testament stories 
on the outside encompass the story of the New Testament, which is the inside of the church. Um, the next few slides address um, some of the frescoes inside Ahtamar. And they all come from the New Testament uh, scenes. And I think, again, to bear in mind, it's very interesting to make the point that the, in the uh, New Testament narratives encompass are encompassed within the old. I took this picture when I was there. You can see the altar right up front um, in, 20, in, 19, in 2015. Um, but to zoom in a little bit more on the frescoes inside the church here, the inside of the church are, and the depictions of the New Testament scenes are immediately viewed from the starting from the resurrection of uh, Lazarus. It's one of the best preserved frescoes. Uh, many of them are not in very good condition, but this one, as you can see, is vividly uh, visible. Um, and we see Lazarus's resurrection and Jesus' entry to Jerusalem on the right. To the north, um, we, we have the crucifixion of Christ and the tomb where he was placed in. And you can see the left side is the crucifixion and the tomb to the right. I find it interesting to see the colors that, again, after, what is it, about a thousand years roughly, uh, well, uh, still in a, in a position where we can actually reflect and see on the, 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 the different uh, shapes, colors. Um, and I think going back to the previous slide, you can see how well The, depiction, the depictions are in this frescoes. I looked for a photo to show you the second floor where the king would have been, you know, viewing the liturgy. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find one. There, it, it is out there though. Um, but here, you, if you were to be at his eye level, you could see all the different frescoes running all across. Uh, the second floor area uh, during, one, and the interesting design of the internal structure is that you could see multiple different angles all at the same time. Here's uh, again inside the, the Ahtama church from a different angle. And one of the uh, air, one of the images, uh, once again, in addition to not being able to get the second floor view, is the dome. Uh, the dome also has the eight windows. Of which we have already talked about and how that represents the eighth being the new creation. But it, it was a, a surreal experience actually to be singing in this church and how it reflected because of the way the various columns are put together. And uh, there's a complete different structuring in the church that, have, that is very different from um, churches of, the of that time, but also later that gave a very... Um, a strong sound to each tone that and I, the, the reason I had the image earlier on with the gentleman singing it was absolutely captivating to hear how the sound reflected um and I I wish I had a recording to share that with you but that's just um, something to really think about how this was put together intentionally it wasn't just only captivating the sight but also the various other senses. That is what we, how one heard the liturgy.
So I would like to get back to let me see here one of the other church images. One second. Looking at the Ahtama Church, the Holy Cross Church on this island and its survival, it's I it brings so many stories to mind uh, from both uh, journalists, our architects, and various other um, narratives. But I'd like to share one with you. Um, it was the survival of this architect, this uh, the sorry, the survival of, of this uh, artifact and the survival of this church has a long story and it shares uh, the faith uh, and thankfully it doesn't share the faith of the many of the churches in the area. Um, sometime after the genocide in the early 1900s, uh, this church was, uh, we would actually not have the uh, luxury, I would say, to even uh, study and understand the history of what uh, of the area, but also the beautiful theological motifs and designs and the history of the Austronese, if it was not for uh, a journalist who happened to be on a boat um, going from one end of the lake, I believe, to the other. He was going from, uh, if I'm not mistaken, from uh, the Khalat or Tatfan region to the to the sh to the shore to the eastern shore near Vostan and Ban, when he saw the destruction of the Aftamaj church, uh, they had already destroyed many of the complexes around it, the castle, the seals, and whatnot. And he immediately reported this uh, to uh, the governing bodies uh, in the area, uh, and they. Uh, very shortly, I mean, immediate. I, I, this is impressive to me that it was uh, acted upon immediately uh, to bring about the uh, the immediate uh, cessation of that destruction. So I believe it was sometime. This has happened. This story has taken place multiple times. So sometime in the 1950s, this took place also in the late 1960s where there has been an extensive effort to keep this church uh, and the structure alive um, and to speak what it actually speaks to us today. So um, if it wasn't for this efforts of this one journalist, I would say we would not have the uh, privilege of seeing and having access to uh, this historic insight uh, coming to us from the 10th century um, and also the, all everything that goes with it. Um, having now assessed uh, some of the visual uh, effects of what the Holy Cross Church is and uh, everything that goes with it, I think I would like to just put a, a have a five minute break very quickly and I would like to come back and talk a little bit more about uh, the various other stories that have actually played a major role in the development and the preservation of the Aftamar Galderico State and the Aftamar Holy Cross Church. Uh, so if it's okay to take about five minute break and then uh, we shall continue. All right, thank you everyone, we're back. So now having looked at the external and internal of the Holy Cross Church, I would like to take a few minutes and talk about the Gatericosate and the Gatericoi who were uh, leaders of the Ahtama Church. I started the, uh, the preserving efforts of the Holy Cross Church towards the end of the life of the church in 1950s, uh, pres uh, observed and preserved by this one journalist, but there's a lot more to it. A lot more has gone before in the span of that eight, 900 years of the history of this church uh, to really uh, preserve not only the physical structure of it, but the spiritual life of the Armenian Christians in this area. Um, I would like to take us to the late medieval period, um, roughly at the time of Gatarikos Zakaria I, who ruled in the area under the Mongol 
Ilkhanids, uh, sometime between the 1303 to 1336, where he actually revitalized and re-emerged the building activities of his ancestors. Uh, so Ahtamar, the Holy Cross Church, as it stood at the time, went through another uh, extensive restoration and rebuilding. And as we learn from uh, Toma Arsruni in his book, I believe it's book four, where the activities of not only the castle, but the, uh, the church, the Holy Cross Church, was mainly possible for two reasons. The, the talent and the ability and the and the activities of Zakaria the first and how the, the person he was to be able to negotiate and to meet with the Islamic authorities to allow him to be able to do this massive project in this in a time when they were living under the uh, uh, the Mongol Ilkhanid rule. Because of Gatirgo Zakaria the first, Uh, the Holy Cross Church not only was protected and preserved, it was there was there was more elaborative work and expansion done, and it was made possible on the island. Now, moving a bit a few centuries, a few decades later, the Holy Cross Church faced another challenge. And this time, it was a bit serious in the sense that all up until that point, all the challenges that the area, the Christian population and also the Holy Cross Church experienced was negotiated and redirected to in a way that was um, that did not end up in sort of the life of uh, the loss of life of someone, if I may put it that way. And this brings me to the story of Zakaria the second who was the Kaderikos of Ahtamar and the only martyred Kaderikos of uh, Ahtamar's history. Um, in 1369, he assumed his Kaderikos uh, position, uh, the incumbency at the, uh, at the Holy Cross Church, and led a very active uh, life and um, a ch church life, I would say, uh, not only on the island, but around the island. So if we go back to one of the earlier images of the church activities uh, here, um, Zakaria II made possible not only for the pre preservation and the constructions and the life of um, a Holy Cross Church, but also the churches I mentioned earlier, which no longer exist, that is Georg and Sur Stepanos, um, and a few others from the area, especially in Bostan. So his activities were uh, across the island, east, north, south, west, uh, having jurisdiction and ecclesial uh, jurisdiction over uh, 140 plus uh, churches with about 42 different villages. Um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, something like 70 monasteries. It was a very active period. The challenge facing Kaderiko Zakaria II then was related to his relations uh, with the Islamic authorities of the time. Now, there was a Emirate that emerged in this period, uh, the Hakari uh, Principality, Kurdish Emirate, and there was a very it was a con, con, it was a period of contestation between various powers. And Ahtamar stood the island of Ahtamar stood at the section between Baresh, which was at that time already under Kurdish rule, and also Vostan and Bonn, which were, again, centers, very important for political life at that time. So what we have experienced and seen in history with Zakaria I and what he was able to achieve, he now was, um, we, are, we are now revisiting similar events with Zakaria II, who 
in this time was in a position to not defend the church's architecture alone, but the people, the Christian population who trusted and existed uh, under the protection of this Agathericos. Uh, so we are we learn in history, in the Ahtama history, that in some time in 1393, there was a plan to actually take over the Holy Cross Church. Um, we learn of a Muslim judge who comes to the island who wants to make this be his um a place from where he can actually have juridical rule. If I uh, he had a place where he can judge apostates, if I may put it that way, so Christians who had become Muslims and who had returned to their uh, Christian faith. So there were I, I, all the green boxes we see in this, and all the blue areas are locations where these sorts of cases were being contested. So when there was a, uh, if we look further south in Mulk, where there was a case of uh, apostasy claim. From Mulk, uh, protection was found on the island of Ahtamar, which was a problem for the Qadis, this is the Muslim judges, because they had to be tried for their apostasy, not to escape to a protective uh, island like Ahtamar, where the Qadi did not have jurisdiction. It was a it was a protection of a Christian enclave, uh, fully ran by the uh, Qadernikos at the time. So in 1393, the Muslim judge came to the island and wanted to exert his authority over the island. And by doing so, he would take over um, essentially the cases that were being brought to his attention. This allegations that these Christians who have been Muslims now or have turned to Christian are finding their protection in this Holy Cross Church on the island of Ahtamar, which at the time also had uh, areas where the, uh, I mean, it was an island with full. Uh, city essentially uh, uh, running the life of what one would call a city life people could survive on the island for a long time so Gabriel Zakaria II faced the challenge of what it meant to preserve his their Christian presence through this um, uh, through, through their livelihood which was made possible on the island so in the in June, summer of 1393, uh, faced Gabriel Zakaria II faced this challenge with the Qadi, which brought about give two options that he had. One was to give over the island and the church and the uh, palace, uh, everything that the island stood for, to um, the local emir, Izaldin. Amiri Zaldin, or by, by doing so, he is accepting Islam. And as the head of the church accepting Islam, what that entailed also was that you not only give over your properties, but also now the people who actually relied on the protection of that area, of the Holy Cross Church and uh, the island will also be uh, in a position to give up their livelihood. So all of this brought together in this period in 1393, Katariko Zakaria, his experience and his life is yet another moment in the history of this place where he stood the challenge that was being, uh, that he was facing by the ruling authorities at the time. And by doing so, he gave up his life. He became a martyr. And I spoke of, <clears throat> I spoke of Hamazes and uh, Sahak and Hamazes, who were the martyrs of, of the eighth century, Arthuri. So in his heritage or lineage of family martyrs, Sakaya II also became a martyr. He was not witnessing to Christ as his uh, not, give, not giving up his Christian faith. Um, but also representing his Christian population, the men and women who relied on him. So we are told in his narrative of uh, how Zakaria II was killed, a very uh, horrendous death for Gatarikos, dragged across the streets of uh, Bostan. 
stoned to death, killed to death, and beheaded all at the very end. Eventually, the emir of the city gave him the right, uh, the Christian right of burial, and Zakaria II was buried on the island of Ahtamar, or is buried on the island of Ahtamar next to his parents. Um, and if you ever have the chance to visit the island, you will see those tombstones. Not all of them are preserved. I believe the, the earliest one that we have is from this 14th century period. Um, now, sharing that story for me, it's also interesting. Why? Because the life of this church is full of these points in history, uh, of its history, where it's required such measures for its protection. And because of Zacharias's efforts, we have the flourishing of the Ahtamar Katharikos state for another 400 years, something of, uh, four, four, a little more, four or 500 years, um, immediately after him, Zakaria III, actually David II takes over the Galderico state after Zakaria II, and then Zakaria III, so if we can create a, a little family tree from Zakaria I, II, and III, Zakaria III was actually in a position to uh, throne an Armenian king named um, Stepanos, uh, who ruled only for seven years. Um, nonetheless, the success uh, of one F of the effort of Zakaria II was very much, uh, you know, noticed in the people's um, experience immediately, but also in, in the duration of the 500 years that the Gatarico State survived. Coming to the very end of the Gatarico State's history, um, I have this, uh, I took this photo in 2015 when I was there. We have a initial here with I, uh, men and pure, who I don't know what it stands for, but it's the last person on the island that left Ahtamad, 1905. We see that engraved on there, 1905. Um, I believe this is on the south side of the Holy Cross Church. And it's interesting to me, and uh, looking at the history of about a thousand year uh, uh, narrative and uh, investment that has taken place around this church, where my family history comes in, because the before 1905, there was a major uh, martyrdom that took place not too far from the island. But the Ahtamar priests, uh, five of them, were martyred sometime in 1890 five, six, uh, on the shores of Vaughan. But before then, they were the last priests who preserved everything on the island, um, uh, right up until about, eight, I believe the date is 1896. So then we have this last person leaving the island in 1905, making his mark on this you know, timeless artifact to say something along the lines of that we are still here. Um, so one, two of those five who were martyred were my family, and it's really, uh, having thought about the history of the Ahtamar Holy Cross Church for roughly the last 15 years, um, I almost find it nearly impossible to lecture, uh, or to be in a position to lecture, uh, on the depths of this, uh, and the meaning of this artifact, but I hope that that's, that has been uh, helpful and, and illuminative and encouraging, perhaps inspiring, to know what the art, the, the history of this uh, church, not only its architecture, uh, but also the narratives that it holds, not only on the outside and the inside of the church, but around uh, the, uh, the, the lives that it has touched throughout the thousand years that have written about it that we can actually be uh, inspired and learn from today. So I'd like to close with that and then uh, leave some time for questions and uh, discussion. And I would love to explore any of the slides or areas that I uh, was too quick to uh, pass through. So I would be happy to do that. So I will leave uh, my last comments with that. Dr. Well, thank you, Dr. Shahinian, for 
letting us come with you to view at least a few of the of the interesting treasures of this place. It's quite ironic, isn't it, that uh, this Catholico state began in opposition to the Catholico state in Cilicia, and yet despite that contentious beginning, it, it became effectively the most vibrant and the most stubborn, so to speak, of the Catholico mm -hmm. states that uh, survived into the 20th century. Thank you also for showing us how a building is more than a building. Mm. Uh, this was a center of culture. It was a guarantor of identity. It was so many other things. One has to wonder about some of the other churches that we've looked at that we don't have quite as much information about was the same role played by them mm. as well.